iridescence like these and lose ourselves entirely in the universe of shimmer. I should forget how you betrayed and only weep your doom. If a man runs off the edge of a cliff, he will not fall. I want to wear your smile on my sleeve. And now you want to restore my youthful errors. A dance floor built on springs. All memory resolves itself in gaze. And welcome to the 10th annual Vermont Poetry Out Loud State Finals from the studios of Vermont PBS. Vermont's first poet laureate Robert Frost once wrote that poetry is when an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found words. Tonight, 10 high school students from across the state will bring us the emotions, the thoughts, and the words of great poets as they compete in the Vermont Poetry Out Loud finals. Poetry Out Loud is a national competition that encourages students in grades 9 through 12 to explore great poetry through memorization and recitation. The finalists in tonight's competition have been chosen from more than 5,000 Vermont students in 43 high schools. From Winooski to Woodstock, from Brattleboro to Barton, students participating in Poetry Out Loud this year. The winner of tonight's state championship will go on to represent the state of Vermont at the national finals in Washington, D.C., and will compete against 53 other contestants, one from each of the 50 states, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and District of Columbia, for up to $20,000 in prize money. And while the students reciting poems by heart have a very challenging task, we should also acknowledge the dauntingly difficult work of the judges who have to evaluate these recitations. I'd like to introduce them to you now. Vermont's Poet Laureate, Sid Lee. <laughs> Poet and University of Vermont professor, Major Jackson. <laughs> Memoirist and poet, Reeve Lindbergh. Poet and Executive Director of VSA Vermont, Judy Chalmer. Actress and Educator, Morgan Irons. And tabulating the scores from the Vermont Arts Council, Lori Hayer and Troy Hickman. So, with that, let's begin round one of the Poetry Out Loud 2015 Vermont State Finals. The Legend by Garrett Hongo. In Chicago, it is snowing softly, and a man has just done his wash for the week. He steps into the twilight of early evening, carrying a wrinkled shopping bag full of neatly folded clothes, and, for a moment, enjoys the feel of warm laundry and crinkled paper flannel-like against his gloveless hands. There's a Rembrandt glow on his face, a triangle of orange in the hollow of his cheek as a last flash of sunset blazes the storefronts and lit windows of the street. He is Asian, Thai or Vietnamese, and very skinny, dressed as one of the poor in rumpled suit pants and a plaid mackinaw dingy and too large. He negotiates the slick of ice on the sidewalk by his car, opens the fair lane's back door, leans to place the laundry in, and turns for an instant toward the flurry of footsteps and cries of pedestrians as a boy. That's all he was. Backs from the corner package store, shooting a pistol firing at once at the dumbfounded man who falls forward, grabbing at his chest. A few sounds escape from his mouth, a babbling no one understands as people surround him, bewildered at his speech. The noises he makes are nothing to them. The boy has gone lost in the light array of foot traffic, dappling the snow with fresh prints. Tonight, 
I read about Descartes' grand courage to doubt everything except his own miraculous existence, and I feel so distinct from the wounded man lying on the concrete. I am ashamed. Let the night sky cover him as he dies. Let the weaver girl cross the bridge of heaven and take up his cold hands. Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown, but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn-bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. Part for the Whole by Robert Francis When others run to windows or out of doors to catch the sunset whole, he is content with any segment, anywhere he sits. From segment, fragment, he can reconstruct the whole, prefers to reconstruct the whole, as if to say, I see more seeing less. A window to the east will serve as well as window to the west, for eastern sky echoes the western sky, and even less, a patch of light that picture glass happens to catch from window glass, Fragment of, fragment flawed, distorted, dulled, nevertheless gives something on glass nature cannot give. The old obliquity of art and proves part may be more than whole. Least may be best. Cartoon Physics, Part 1, by Nick Flynn. Children under, say, 10 shouldn't know that the universe is ever-expanding, inexorably pushing into the vacuum, galaxies swallowed by galaxies, whole solar systems collapsing, all of it acted out in silence. At ten, we are still learning the rules of cartoon animation. That if a man draws a door on a rock, only he can pass through it. Anyone else who tries will crash into the rock. Ten-year-olds should stick with burning houses, car wrecks, ships going down, earthbound, tangible disasters, arenas where they can be heroes. You can run back into a burning house. Sinking ships have lifeboats. The trucks will come with their ladders. If you jump, you will be saved. A child 
places her hand on the roof of a school bus and drives across a city of sand. She knows the exact spot it will skid, at which point the bridge will give, who will swim to safety, and who will be pulled under by sharks. She will learn that if a man runs off the edge of a cliff, he will not fall until he notices his mistake. Beautiful Wreckage by W.D. Earhart. What if I didn't shoot the old lady running away from our patrol? Or the old man in the back of the head? Or the boy in the marketplace? Or what if the boy, but he didn't have a grenade? And the woman in Hugh didn't lie in the rain in a mortar pit with seven marines just for food. Gaffney didn't get hit in the knee. Ames didn't die in the river. Ski didn't die in a Medicav chopper between Con Thien and Da Nang. In Vietnamese, Con Thien means place of angels. What if it really was Instead of the place of rotting sandbags, incoming heavy artillery, rats, and mud. What if the angels were Ames and Ski? Or the lady, the man, and the boy? And they lifted Gaffney out of the mud and healed his shattered knee. What if none of it had happened the way I said? Would it all be a lie? Would the wreckage be suddenly beautiful? Would the dead rise up and walk? Novel by Arthur Rimbaud. One, we aren't serious when we're 17. One fine evening, to hell with beer and lemonade, noisy cafes with their shining lamps, we walk under the green linden trees of the park. The lindens smell good in the good June evenings. At times the air is so scented that we close our eyes. The wind laden with sounds. The town isn't far. Has the smell of grapevines and beer. Two. There you can see a very small patch of dark blue framed by a little branch, pinned up by a naughty star that melts in gentle quivers, small and very white. Night in June, 17 years old, we are overcome by it all. The sap is champagne and goes to our head. We talked a lot and feel a kiss on our lips, trembling there like a small insect. Three, our wild heart moves through novels like Robinson Crusoe. When, in the light of a pale street lamp, a girl goes by, attractive and charming, under the shadow of her father's terrible collar, and as she finds you incredibly naive while clicking her little boots, she turns abruptly and in a lively way. Then... Cavatinas die on your lips. Four. You are in love. Occupied until the month of August, you are in love. Your sonnets make her laugh. All your friends go off. You are ridiculous. Then one evening, the girl you worship deigned to write to you. That evening, you return to the bright cafes. You ask for beer or lemonade. We're not serious when we are 17 and when we have green linden trees in the park.
A Display of Mackerel by Mark Doty. They lie in parallel rows on ice, head to tail, each a foot of luminosity barred with black bands, which divide the scale's radiant sections like seams of lead in a Tiffany window. Iridescent, watery prismatics, think abalone, the wildly rainbowed mirror of a soap bubble sphere, think sun on gasoline. Splendor and splendor, and not a one in any way distinguished from the other. Nothing about them of individuality. Instead, they're all exact expressions of the one soul, each a perfect fulfillment of a heaven's template, mackerel essence. As if, after a lifetime arriving at this enameling, the jewelers made uncountable examples, each as intricate in its oily fabulation as the one before. Suppose we could iridesce like these and lose ourselves entirely in the universe of shimmer. Would you want to be yourself only, unduplicatable, doomed to be lost? They'd prefer plainly to be flashing participants, multitudinous. Even now they seem to be bolting forward, heedless of stasis. They don't care they're dead and nearly frozen. Just as, presumably, they didn't care that they were living. All, all for all, the rainbowed school and its acres of brilliant classrooms in which no verb is singular or every one is. How happy they seem, even on ice, to be together, selfless, which is the price of gleaming. Famous by Naomi Shihab Nye. The river is famous to the fish. The loud voice is famous to silence, which knew it would inherit the earth before anybody said so. The cat sleeping on the fence is famous to the birds watching him from the birdhouse. The tear is famous briefly to the cheek. The idea you carry close to your bosom is famous to your bosom. The boot is famous to the earth, more famous than the dress shoe, which is famous only to floors. The bent photograph is famous to the one who carries it, and not at all famous to the one who is pictured. I want to be famous to shuffling men who smile while crossing streets, sticky children in grocery lines, famous as the one who smiled back. I want to be famous in the way a pulley is famous or a buttonhole. Not because it did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. Holy Sonnets, Batter My Heart, Three-Person God by John Dunn. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet, but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I like a usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captived and proves weak or untrue. Yet, dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again, take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you enthrall me. Never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me.
Crepuscule with Muriel by Marilyn Hacker. Instead of a cup of tea, instead of a milk silk whelk of a cup, of a cup of nearly six o'clock tea time, cup of a stumbling block, cup of an afternoon unredeemed by talk, cup of a cut brown loaf of a slice a lack of butter, blueberry jam that's almost black. Instead of tannin seeping into the cracks of a pot, the void of an hour seeps out, infects the slit of a cut I haven't the wit to fix with a surgeon's needle threaded with fine gauge silk, as a key would thread the cylinder of a lock. But no key threads the cylinder of a lock. Late afternoon light, transitory, licks the place of the absent cup with its rough tongue, flicks itself out beneath the wheel's revolving spoke. Taut thoughts gone, with a blink of attention, slack, a vision of death and distance in the mix. She lost her words, and how did she get them back when the corridor of a day was a lurching deck? The dream life logic encodes in nervous ticks. She translated to a syntax which connects intense and unfashionable politics with morning coffee, Hudson sunset, sex. Then the short circuit of the final stroke, the end toward which all lines looped out then broke. What a gaze out the window interjects. On the southeast corner, a black lab box. Tugged as the light clicks green toward a late day walk by a plump brown girl in a purple anorak. The Bronx bound local comes rumbling up the tracks out of the tunnel over West Harlem blocks whose windows gleam on the animal warmth of bricks rouged by the fluffy light of six o'clock. Now, let's move on to round two. Our first round two recitation is by Anna Van Dyne. Anna attends Harwood Union High School she has an affinity for words as well as stories. She says that she probably takes a little bit too much joy in being right. Anna? <laughs> Monet Refuses the Operation by Liesl Mueller. Doctor. You say there are no halos around the street lights in Paris, and what I see is an aberration caused by old age, an affliction. I tell you it has taken me all my life to arrive at the vision of gas lamps as angels to soften and blur and finally banish the edges you regret I don't see, to learn that the line I called the horizon does not exist, and sky and water so long apart are the same state of being. Fifty-four years before I could see Rouen Cathedral is built on parallel shafts of sun, and now you want to restore my youthful errors, fixed notions of top and bottom, the illusion of three-dimensional space, wisteria separate from the bridge it covers. What can I say to convince you the Houses of Parliament dissolve night after night to become the fluid dream of the Thames? I 
will not return to a universe of objects that don't know each other, as if islands were not the lost children of one great continent. The world is flux, and light becomes what it touches, becomes water, lilies on water, above and below water, becomes lilac and mauve and yellow and white and cerulean lamps, small fists passing sunlight so quickly to one another that it would take long streaming hair inside my brush to catch it to paint the speed of light. Our weighted shapes, these verticals burn to mix with air and change our bone, skin, clothes to gases. Doctor, if only you could see how heaven pulls earth into its arms and how infinitely the heart expands to claim this world, blue vapor, without end. Next up is Rose Merriam. Rose attends Spalding High School. She enjoys participating in theater, and she attributes her success with Poetry Out Loud in part to the influence of her teachers and school community. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. Begin and cease. And then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the bright folds of a girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah, love. Let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams. So various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Cara Mativier is a senior at St. Johnsbury Academy. She loves modern dance as well as writing and listening to slam poetry. Cara? Revenge by Letitia Elizabeth 
Landon. I gaze upon her rose-wreathed hair and gaze upon her smile. Seem as you drank the very air her breath perfumed the while and wake for her the gifted line that wild and witching lay and swear your heart is as a shrine that only owns her sway. Tis well. I am revenged at last. Mark you that scornful cheek. The eye averted as you passed spoke more than words could speak. I, now by all the bitter tears that I have shed for thee, the racking doubts, the burning fears, avenged they well may be by the nights past in sleepless care, the days of endless woe, all that you taught my heart to bear, all that yourself will know I would not wish to see you laid within an early tomb. I should forget how you betrayed and only weep your doom. But this is fitting punishment to live and love in vain. Oh, my wrung heart, be thou content and feed upon his pain. Go thou and watch her lightest sigh thine own it will not be and bask beneath her sunny eye it will not turn on thee tis well the rack the chain the wheel far better hast thou proved even i could almost pity feel for thou art nor beloved. Abby Tone is a junior at Mount Mansfield Union High School. She's been singing and acting well, since she could talk. Abby plans on trying out for the television show The Voice as well as becoming a tattoo artist in Boston. <laughs> Abby? I am trying to break your heart by Kevin Young. I am hoping to hang your head on my wall in shame. The slightest taxidermy thrills me. Fish forever leaping on the living room wall. Paperweights made from skulls of small animals. I want to wear your smile on my sleeve and break your heart like a horse or its leg. Weeks of being bucked off, then all at once, you're mine. Put me down. I want to call you thine, to tattoo mercy along my knuckles. I assassin down the avenue. I hope to have you forgotten by noon, to know you by your knees, palsied by prayer. Loneliness is a science. Consider the taxidermist's tender hands trying to keep from losing skin the bobcat grin of the living. Nikki Gadboys attends Milton High School, an aspiring comedian she hopes one day to be on Saturday Night Live. She's very active in her school's theater department and enjoys all foods of the pizza variety. <laughs> Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Laugh and the world laughs with you. 
weep and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing and the hills will answer. Sigh? It is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice and men will seek you. Grieve? And they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. Feast, and your halls are crowded fast, and the world goes by. Succeed and give, and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train. But one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. Sam Budro is a senior at Bellows Free Academy. He says he participates in poetry out loud because he enjoys expressing himself through the words of another. And the program gives him the opportunity also to enhance his public speaking and performance skills. Sam? Degrees of Grain, Phillipsburg by Richard Hugo. You might come here Sunday on a whim. Say your life broke down. The last good kiss you had was years ago. You walk these streets laid out by the insane, past hotels that didn't last, bars that did, the tortured try of local drivers to accelerate their lives. Only churches are kept up. The jail turned 70 this year. The only prisoner is always in, not knowing what he's done. The principal supporting business now is rage. Hatred of the various grays the mountain sends. Hatred of the mill, the silver bill repeal, the best liked girls who leave each year for butte. One good restaurant in bars can't wipe the boredom out. The 1907 boom, eight going silver mines, a dance floor built on springs. All memory resolves itself in gaze. In panoramic green, you know the cattle eat. Or two stacks high above the town, two dead kilns, the huge mill in collapse for 50 years that won't fall finally down. Isn't this your life? That ancient kiss still burning out your eyes? Isn't this defeat so accurate? The church bell simply seems a pure announcement. Ring and no one comes. Don't empty houses ring. Our magnesium in scorn, sufficient to support a town. Not just Phillipsburg, but towns of towering blondes, good jazz and booze. The world will never let you have until the town you came from dies inside. Say no to yourself. The old man, 20 when the jail was built, still laughs, although his lips collapse. Someday soon, he says, I'll go to sleep and not wake up. You tell him no, you're talking to yourself. The car that brought you here still runs. The money you buy lunch with, no matter where its mind is silver. And the girl who serves your food is slender. And her red hair lights the wall.
Kira Hansen from Mount Anthony Union High School enjoys making art, reading poetry, and the work of Oscar Wilde. Listening to indie music, watching films, and thrift shopping. She hopes to be involved in the theater or the film industry someday. Kira? The Applicant by Sylvia Plath. First, are you our sort of a person? Do you wear a glass eye, false teeth, or a crutch, a brace, or a hook? rubber breasts, or a rubber crotch? Stitches to show something's missing? No, no? Then how can we give you a thing? Stop crying. Open your hand. Empty? Empty. Here is a hand to fill it, and willing to bring teacups and roll away headaches and do whatever you tell it. Will you marry it? It is guaranteed to thumb shut your eyes at the end and dissolve of sorrow. We make new stock from the salt. I notice you are stark naked. How about this suit, black and stiff, but not a bad fit. Will you marry it? It is waterproof, shatterproof, proof against fire and bombs through the roof. Believe me. They'll bury you in it. And now your head, excuse me, is empty. I have the ticket for that. Come here, sweetie, out of the closet. Well, what do you think of that? Naked as paper to start, but in 25 years she'll be silver. In 50, gold, a living doll. Everywhere you look, it can sew, it can cook, it can talk, talk, talk. It works. There's nothing wrong with it. You have a hole, it's a poultice. You have an eye, it's an image. My boy, it's your last resort. Will you marry it? Marry it. Marry it. Emily Clark is a sophomore from Lake Region Union High School. This is her second year participating in Poetry Out Loud. She loves to sing and the arts in general because of their ability to convey emotion. Emily. In Praise of Pain by Heather McHugh. A brilliance takes up residence in flaws. A brilliance all the unshipped faces of design refuse. Wine collects its starlets at a lip's fault. Sunlight where the nicked glass angles, and affection where the eye is least correctable, where arrows of unquivered light are lodged, where someone else's eyes have come to be concerned. For beauty's sake, assault and drive and burn the devil from the simply perfect sun. Demand a birthmark on the skin of love, a tremble in the touch. In come a cry, and let the silverware of nights be flecked. The moon pocked to distribute more or less indwelling alloys of its dim and shine by nip and tuck by chance's dance of laws. The brightness, drawn and quartered on a sheet. The moment cracked upon the bed will last as if you soldered them with moon and flux. And break the bottle of the eye to see what lights are spun of accident and glass. A senior at Arlington High School, Jessie Keel, says that she spends most of her time reading, writing, and sleeping. She's currently looking for a way to do all three simultaneously. Okay. (laughs) 
On Pickiness by Rodney Jones. When the first mechanical picker had stripped the field, it left such a copious white dross of disorderly wispiness that my mother could not console herself to the waist and insisted on having it picked over with human hands. Though anyone could see there was not enough for ten sheets and the hands had long since gone into the factories. No matter how often my father pointed this out, she worried it the way I've worried the extra words and poems that I conceived with the approximate notion that each stanza should have the same number of lines and each line the same number of syllables, and disregarded it, telling myself a ripple or botch on the surface, like the stutter of a speaker, is all I have to affirm the deep fluency below. The Hebrews distrusted Greek poetry, which embodied harmony and symmetry and therefore a vision, not for aesthetic reasons, but because they believed that to change the first words which rose and smelted from the trance amounted to sacrilege against God. In countries where, because of the gross abundance of labor, it is unlawful to import harvesting machines, I see the women in the fields and think of how when my mother used to pick, you could tell her row by the bare stalks and the scant poundage that tumbled from her sack so pristinely white and devoid of burrs, it seemed to have already passed through the spiked mandibles of the gin. Dr. Williams said of Eliot that his poems were so cautiously wrought that they seemed to come to us already digested in all four stomachs of the cow. What my father loved about my mother was not just the beauty of her body and face, but the practice of her ideas and the intelligence of her hands as they made the house that abides in us still as worry and bother but also the perfect freedom beyond, as cleanliness is next to godliness, but is not God. Our final contestant is Emily Williams from Burr and Burton Academy. Outside of school, Emily spends most of her time running, skiing, playing violin, and reading. While she enjoys the snow, she is indeed looking forward, like the rest of us, to the warmer months when she can buy fresh produce, hike in the mountains, go fishing and swimming, and all those other things that we can't do in the dead of winter. <laughs> Emily? The Destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron. George Gordon. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen. Like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown, that host on the morrow lay withered and strown. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. And the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill. And their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. And there lay the steed with his nostril all wide, but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride. 
and the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf and cold as the spray of the rock beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail. And the tents were all silent. The banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpets unblown. And the widows of Asher are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Round three. The scores from the first and second rounds have been tabulated. The three highest scoring contestants will now recite a final poem. The scores that they earn in this round will be added to their current totals and will be used to select Vermont's representative to the Poetry Out Loud National Finals in Washington, D.C. That's April 28th. Put it on your calendar. So our contestants in round three. First, Samuel Boudreau. One Hundred Love Sonnet 17 by Pablo Neruda. I don't love you as if you were a rose of salt, topaz, or arrow of carnations that propagate fire. I love you as one loves certain obscure things, secretly between the shadow and the soul. I love you as the plant that doesn't bloom, but carries the light of those flowers hidden within itself. And thanks to your love, the tight aroma that arose from the earth lives dimly in my body. I love you without knowing how, or when, or from where. I love you directly, without problems or pride. I love you like this, because I don't know any other way to love, except in this form in which I am not, nor are you. So close that your hand upon my chest is mine. So close that your eyes close with my dreams. Next. Anna Van Dyne. Friendship After Love by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. After the fierce midsummer all ablaze has burned itself to ashes and expires in the intensity of its own fires, there come the mellow, mild St. Martin days, crowned with the calm of peace, but sad with haze. So after love has led us till he tires of his own throes and torments and desires, comes large-eyed friendship with a restful gaze, he beckons us to follow, and across cool, verdant vales, we wander free from care. Is it a touch of frost lies in the air? Why are we haunted with a sense of loss? We do not wish the pain back or the heat, and yet, and 
Yet, these days are incomplete. Finally, Emily Williams. Cartoon Physics, Part 1, by Nick Flynn. Children under, say, 10 shouldn't know that the universe is ever expanding, inexorably pushing into the vacuum, galaxies swallowed by galaxies, whole solar systems collapsing. All of it acted out in silence. At 10, we are still learning the rules of cartoon animation. That if a man draws a door on a rock, only he can pass through it. Anyone else who tries will crash into the rock. Ten-year-olds should stick with burning houses, car wrecks, ships going down, earthbound, tangible disasters. Arenas where they can be heroes. You can run back into a burning house. Sinking ships have lifeboats. The trucks will come with their ladders. If you jump, you will be saved. A child places her hand on the roof of a school bus and drives across a city of sand. She knows the exact spot it will skid, at which point the bridge will give, who will swim to safety, and who will be pulled under by sharks. She will learn that if a man runs off the edge of a cliff, he will not fall until he notices his mistake. Our runner-up, and the new state champion to follow, our runner-up for the Poetry Out Loud 2015 competition is Emily Williams. And the 2015 Vermont Poetry Out Loud state champion, recipient of a $200 award, an all-expense paid trip for two to Washington, D.C., and a $500 stipend for the school library, Samuel Boudreaux. Congratulations. Thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations to all of our contestants. I'm Rob Brown for Vermont PBS and Poetry Out Loud. Thank you and good night.